This is the Yanks Go Yard Podcast with Adam Weinrib and Thomas Carinante. Welcome to the Yanks Go Yard Podcast. I'm Adam Weinrib alongside Thomas Carinante. Some of you last episode said, oh, I'm hoping for a 7-0 and start next time you guys come back live. And I guess if that's what you're hoping for, the 2024 Yankees have deeply disappointed you. But if you are reasonable and rational, then uh, six and one against the Houston Astros and defending National League champion Diamondbacks, both of them on the road to start the year. It's such a long road trip. I forgot the Yankees are allowed to play at home, which they are going to be doing on Friday against the Toronto Blue Jays. Home opener, come to Yanks Go Yard for your coverage. But they are six and one on the year. And the seventh win, uh, game, sixth win, I, I want to call it the most exciting of all of them, but there's that last one in Houston and the first one in Houston. Most of these have been extremely exciting. So if you're a pessimist, uh, you know, you look at the run differential and you're like, I don't know, it could turn around. Yeah, I don't think the Yankees are going to win at a 6-1 and one pace for the rest of the year. Sorry to disappoint everybody, but if you're someone who enjoys watching baseball and watching the regular season play out, it's been about as exciting as possible, and the Yankees have come out on the right end of every coin flip game. The only one they lost, Nestor Cortez struggled in the first, and the offense never showed up, and the bullpen, they put Jake Cousins in, and they lost. That's the only game they've lost so far. All the tight ones against good teams, victories. So we're going to run it through, uh, do a little bit of a recap, talk about the moments we were most excited, moments we were most nervous, best vibes, worst vibes, moment you might have missed Plus a check-in on Carlos Rodon, two starts in, Aaron Boone's little war with Alex Verdugo, and a preview with the Jays. Thanks for joining us here on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or live on YouTube. We're here Mondays, Thursdays, 2 o'clock Eastern. If you are live on YouTube right now, navigate over to the videos tab. You can watch our interview with Caleb Durbin, Yankees budding top prospect, as well as Dave Winfield, baseball Hall of Famer. If you're on the podcast feed, stay tuned to the end of this one. You'll hear Dave Winfield right here. Don't go anywhere. But the Caleb Durbin episode did go up separately yesterday. So just add another episode to your queue. Nothing wrong with that. Thomas Carinante, welcome to the pod. Uh, Hit everybody with an offer before we go. Break down uh, all the moments everybody needs to think about forever from this D-back series. Yes, sir. Uh, Great week. Great start to the week. So you know what that means. Hit up DraftKings. Uh, We got a fantastic sign-up bonus for new users. Um who can place a $5 bet on any sport and instantly claim $150 in bonus bets. All you got to do is sign up and use our code YANKSGOYARD. The best part is that you will receive these rewards even if that first bet loses. Plenty of baseball to get um, in on the action for. Final four is this weekend. Mm -hmm. NBA playoffs are around the corner. You name it. Um, But using that code YANKSGOYARD will get you these offers. And not only that, um, but it also directly supports the podcast. Me, Adam, Yanks Yard, YanksOyard.com. We're having fun. Help us have more fun. If you're considering signing up for DraftKings, please make sure to sign up and use that code YanksGoYard to maximize those first bets. This offer is only available to new customers who are 21 and older and physically present in legal gambling states. Please remember to always gamble responsibly. Check the episode descriptions for full terms of the offer to see if you qualify. Pretty simple stuff. Um, pretty simple stuff for the Yanks. Series sweep, series win. I uh, am looking forward to pummeling the Blue Jays. I couldn't think of a better time to absolutely pound them into the dirt. They had an awful series against the Astros um, this week, and I think we got we got some good momentum. Won games throughout this entire um, road trip very differently. Uh, a lot of battling back. I think that characterized most of it. Um, but you had that first game of the series of, against the D-backs where it was like, we won, sorry, 5 nothing. it's over. Ended up being 5-2, but um, that seemed very effortless. Um, you have that loss sandwich in between, which is fine. But then yesterday, that was the battle of all battles compared to even the Astro series. Yeah. Um, so I'm loving the way this team is coming home with these good vibes. The fans are going to be as excited as ever. Um, a lot of the problems over the last few years is – the Yankees just not winning games in the right spots. Uh, they might have won a series, but um, they lost the final game instead of sweeping, and they lost it in pretty upsetting fashion. Um, so now that they kind of have the cadence going, I like where we are. I like how everybody's feeling. I like how 
excited everybody is for opening day. Uh, I'm sorry, the home opener tomorrow at Yankee Stadium um, against a division rival who endlessly, endlessly talks shit but has no, no leg to stand on ever. This is the most, one of the most infuriating fan bases in all of um, Major League Baseball. So hopefully this weekend we can show them what it's all about. Again, remember, guys, they were in on Soto. They thought they were getting Soto. They wanted Soto. We have Soto. Um, but let's recap this Diamondback series. Love well, as a wise Blue Jays out. fan once said, you should get fired for that clown take. But please <laughs> move along. Let's fire you. Um, good day to get fired when the Yankees are on fire. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, let's recap this D-back series. A lot of stuff went on. Um Start with happiest moment because I think it's it pays to be happy, right? Well, Always recency bias, recency bias. A lot of the moments that you really remember come from the final game of this series, but also it's just it's the defining game of the set. Narratively, it played out really well for the Yankees. Uh, there's a heartbreaking moment in there where Anthony Volpe takes a you know doesn't take too long to make a throw, but double clutches a little bit makes yeah. a weird one. Rizzo still has the out at first and extras, but the helmet impacts the glove to the point where the ball rolls out you and i both say that should still be an out it's kind of weird that it wasn't like yeah it's an out it's an out when a rod uh glove slaps bronson arroyo but it's not an out when rizzo <laughs> drops the tag on the helmet and the ball rolls away interesting yeah. um no i mean i i get it schoolyard yeah. rules though just peg that guy with the baseball and he's out but that play ends up being even more impactful uh because perdomo has to accelerate injures his leg and that's the only reason that the game ends because a relief pitcher has to bat in Perdomo's spot because they run out of guys. Uh, but happiest moment of the whole series uh, was was certainly from that game for me. And I'm going to go with the judge double to put him up 6-4 in extras because, uh, you know, the Verdugo home run, and obviously this is, this is looking at it in retrospect, but the Verdugo home run, cathartic for Verdugo for sure, uh, gets the monkey off his back, some early season struggles, rolling over some pitches. Uh, they still had three outs to get. They also still had three outs to get after the judge double. But uh, first one, it's like, all right, you, you go immediately in a nail biting time and you're like, now we got a lead to protect and they didn't protect it. Second time around, uh, you're feeling as depressed as possible after escaping to the 11th inning because of the way that the 10th unfolded and you're like, there's no way they score. Like everybody knows the Yankees record and in road extra inning games last year. I don't believe they won a single one. They might've won one, but I'm pretty confident they goose egged. So after they get that, oh no, they won one, the Reds, because uh, Ryan Weaver came in and saved a 7-4 game. I remember that. Nice. Uh, so they barely, they couldn't win an extra innings on the road last year. So they take that first lead and you're nervous because you're like, I hope they reverse last year's trend. Then they don't, you know, they're they're on the road to getting the second out of the inning, clearing the bases. All Holmes needs to do is retire one more guy and then not quite. Volpe with the throw, Rizzo with the drop. First run scores, Glaber gets a single. You're not expecting that. First run of the inning scores on the balk. Great. Soto lines out, and you're pretty much at that point resigned to being like, all right, we're going to the bottom of the inning. The one run lead. See if we can protect this one. Feels pretty unlikely, given the free guy at second base. And there's, I think, some correct discourse today about Clay Holmes is your closer. Uh, he's going to be your closer. But is he the best closer in – extra inning games under the Manfred rules, given the fact that he induces <laughs> ground ball contact, no matter what. Uh, I think there's a world where you maybe don't want to use him in extra innings based on the new rule book, but either way, one run lead, you assume, all right, Grounder's going to move the runner over. You got to hope hot shot Grounder and somebody else like Cattell Marte because a fly ball is going to tie it up. We'll go to another half inning and, and do more of this. But when Judge uh, continues breaking out of the slump with the double in the gap, that is the happiest I felt because I knew, okay, I think, Clay Holmes in a second inning of work could probably protect another two run lead because he basically did protect the two run lead in the first inning of work, just got boned by bad defense and then a little infield chopper. So that's the happiest I was in this entire series. Second place uh, was Anthony Volpe scampering all the way around the bases, not 24 hours after he was scratched from a previous game with Mexican food inspired uh, diarrhea. He managed to run all the way around the bases on a Diamondbacks error, make the team look foolish. But what is your happiest moment of this three game set? You took mine with your second one. Wow! But that's good. I like I like that we like the same things. Um, that uh, that first game. Um, well, well, there's there's two reasons why. Um, it was that third inning in that first game, and it was the fact that they were continuing the momentum which is what this team just has not done for yeah. 
what it's felt like four years. Um, and not only that, they uh, won that game handily without any power. Um, you have that Glaber Torres gapper, but you know, that was not a display of power. That was just, that was simply a hard hit ball, you know, into the gap. Um, it wasn't actually, it wasn't exactly a monster shot. Um, you have the Oswaldo single and um, the Torres double that gets them out to a 2 0 lead and then mayhem in that third inning. Volpe goes four for four in this game. That's his first ever four hit game. Incredible. And then this team wins by putting pressure. what they do? Uh, uh, runners on first and third at that point. Uh, Austin Wells belts one into left field. Sack fly. Great. Never see the Yankees do that. Verdugo, athletic enough to tag up. That puts pressure on Lourdes Gurriel Jr. in left field. He has to rifle one home and rush it. Throws completely off. Pitcher mm -hmm. backs it up. Anthony Volpe is heads up base running. He goes to second on the tag, and then he rounds second and sees the ball got away. He's going for third. Pitcher rushes the throw to third. Ball goes into left field. Anthony Volpe scores. Haven't seen the Yankees scored runs like that in I don't know how long. Um, and if they did, it was a complete accident by the other team being bad. This was more of an instance of the Yankees putting pressure on the defense, being aggressive, taking matters into their own hands. Um, and that's the shit that I like. I love, I love the display of power. I love, there is nothing that I actually love more than when like Giancarlo Stanton's on fire. Mm -hmm. And you know that he's stepping into the batter's box and the pitcher is completely fucked. Um, I know those situations are few and far between now um, because we haven't seen it in some time. Stan's not off to a good start. He's also been injured. But, like, the, everybody loves when the Yankees go on a power surge and they seem unstoppable. And every ball that they're seeing, it, it, it's like a beach ball being lobbed over the middle. But when they are scoring runs by using their athleticism, by using their baseball IQ, I know I sound like everybody's uncle, but that's the most satisfying. It's simply the most satisfying just because why? That's the main part of the, like home runs are great, but guess what? You're not going to be hitting home runs all, all the time. You're going to be winning games by outsmarting your opponents, putting pressure on them when you need to. And that was the exact manner in which the Yankees have to do that against a team like the Diamondbacks, super athletic, super instinctive, and they beat them at their own game. Fucking love it. And Anthony Volpe, obviously the author of some of these, you know, he's going to be at the author of some of these moments all year based on the way he started the season. But uh, he brings a completely different dimension to this team. And oh my he God, looked incredible. early on like he would last year and then he stopped stealing and he got scared and he retreated a little bit because he lost his swing this year. If he keeps everything uh, consistent, he's going to be just a, an absolute weapon outside of the one moment in extra innings. Uh, yesterday, and that is, I mean, that's the obvious winner for the moment that you almost pooped your pants in the series, just because when you are on the verge of taking the series down, and, and it's sort of, uh, it's unexpected, I mean, look at the pitching matchups entering this series, hard-fought series in Houston, uh, you're going in to face an opponent that in some ways at this point in time might be better prepared than the Astros, you know, we didn't have to face no-hitter Ronel Blanco, but the Astros, but they're missing Justin Verlander. Framber Valdez does not look like a number one starter for quite some time. They're missing Lance McCullers. They're going to tell you all about it, but the Diamondbacks are missing nobody. And you've got your fifth starter in Luis Heel starting the first game. And you've got Nestor, who, thanks to his opening day start, is now matched up with aces until the schedule shuffles. So Nestor, Zach Gallen, you know, no game is a loss with this team, but you're looking at that going, I don't, I don't love that. And then Merrill Kelly against Carlos Rodon, who's been – uh, boom, the first two games, but is a boomer bust pitcher at this point in his career until proven otherwise. You look at that and you go, you let your guard down, and you lose the first one, you might get swept. Uh, and then you win the first one and you, you insured yourself you're not going to get swept, but you're not comfortable for the rest of the series. So you take a lead late, especially on the Verdugo home run. You really want to win that game. You yeah. want to secure it as soon as possible. And when that ball trickled out of Rizzo's glove, I, I'm sure I was not the only one going, oh, okay, that's literally the exact thing that couldn't happen here. Like, when you're watching a college basketball game and an underdog, not that the Yankees are an underdog, but the team you, you think everybody thinks the team they're rooting for is an underdog, right? Like when you're watching the game, you're always calculating ways that you could eventually blow the game. That's kind of just how it goes. So when your team's like up eight and they miss a layup, you're like, that's game. And sometimes it is. And usually it's not, but up four, three, all of a sudden the runners on second, you don't get an out on that play. It was sort of safe to be like, all right, that, might be game and Cattell Marte best hitter on the team in this series somehow a little short arm swing to the drawn in infield 
better at bat there and they might just walk it off in the 10th. So that's very much the moment for me when I was the most nervous. There's a clear for me, second place finisher here. And I'm not going to bring it up because I feel like you're probably going to grab it. And I don't want to do that to you again, but don't do it. Just, there weren't that many nerve wracking moments in this series, to be honest. But that one, obviously you start to accept the loss at that point in time. When you see that weird error go down and kudos to this Yankees team. We talked about it, all the breaks they got in the fourth game, the ninth inning against Houston. As Birdie dives and Verdugo slides and the Alvarez Chaco's just foul this is another one where last year there we have the evidence. They don't win extra inning games on the road. They definitely don't win extra inning games on the road where they take a two run lead and blow it. Remember the yeah. Rockies game where oh we were like, no. I wonder, no. I wonder if they can hold on in extras after blowing this in the ninth. That would be uh, the first pitch. Sorry of the inning is sent 485 feet in the left center gap. So this is like the logical antithesis to that game. Like nine months later, I felt the, like I was like, this will never happen. And then it did. They proved us wrong. And not only did they win the game, but they took a two run lead in extras twice, which I, you, I, I never would have predicted that last year. Yeah, I agree. Um, I also almost asked my peas yesterday, but it was not that moment. Um, I thought Carlos Rodon hurt himself in the fifth yeah. inning um, or the sixth. He pitched into the sixth, right? It was like five yeah, and a third. Six, um, six yeah, he was pumping 98, but a couple of the times there, he was obviously overexerting himself. And um, who was on the broadcast? It was David Cohn on the broadcast yesterday. Yeah, we had come. Um, yeah, and he was like, "Yeah, it's clearly Carlos is you know overthrowing. He, he's he's trying he's trying a little bit too hard right now." And the couple of times that he did try to blow the fat uh, you know the fastball um, up in the zone past uh, forgot who it was. Um, he got the velocity, but he came off the mound like weird. He was like walking a little bit closer to the catcher, and he was like wincing a little bit. He was going off to the side, um, and I thought he blew something out shoulder, elbow, foot. Like I don't know. I, I was sitting there and I was like, if he throws another pitch, he's going to be gone for the season. And obviously um, there's a lot of work to be done um, on Carlos Rodon's front. Um, losing him at this point, I'm not saying we, we, it, it'd be good, but like it wouldn't make that much of a difference just because we don't really have anything to build off of with him. He's yet to really do anything um, outside of battle in these first couple starts, which – the Yankees won those games and we got to tip the cap to him. But um, man, losing him in like that just would have been really troubling. And then it would have killed the depth that would have made everything feel worse. So I hope he's OK. We haven't heard anything. I'm assuming that everything's fine. But those couple of pitches there, I was like, oh, my God, we're the headlines are about to shift so hard and we're just going to be in a mess for the next two weeks. That was weird. I mean, he he tripped off the mound weird and then just started ripping fastballs like yeah. a foot and a half above the zone. To, I think it was probably Blaze Alexander because every moment in this series when they got got was Blaze Alexander, who is Arizona's like 24th best prospect. And to that, I say the eye test does not line up with that. Looks pretty nope. good to me. Uh, got his bat around on one of the Rodon fastballs inside. Every home run Rodon allows is an inside fastball where the guy just slaps the bat on it and it flies 355 feet out yeah. or Marte shit on one, but yeah, that was... uh, blaze got one good for blaze. Uh, I mean, my runner up was Luke Weaver bases loaded, no outs in a, a five, one ball game. And I, I, I thought he was going to get out of it because the early season, good vibes. He did somehow got through Marte Carroll and uh, Lord Scurriel jr. With a uh, sack fly pop out line out, but uh yeah sink or swim it's the fifth game of the season they're not bringing in hamilton they're not bringing in homes it's gotta be luke weaver and gotta be luke did the job got a little bit of swag uh so my best vibes moment of the series it's not that one the vibes were fine there honestly best vibes moment of the entire trip for me cutting to the dugout after the verdugo home run where he styled on it a little bit and marcus stroman is wearing that vintage t-shirt that we shit on him for showing up to spring training and 2004 opening day again like it, it, 2004 opening day i think it, we maybe took the wrong angle on it it's the 2004 opening day roster 2004 the worst season in yankees history ever i would not want to relive that season ever again but the last time the life wasn't horrible opening day 2004 right so it's kind of a throwback to, uh, you know, the sunnier days before we had to think about matching up with the Red Sox in that playoff series, before we had to think about protecting a 3-0 lead, before we knew how that season unfolded and we were one pitcher short, we should have kept Andy Pettit 
instead of letting him walk to Houston, a Houston team that made the NLCS. Opening day 2004, we were still the Dynasty Yankees. Coming off a World Series loss, sure, but coming off the Boone home run. Coming off 2001 World Series loss, sure, but at least you made it. 2000, 99, 98, 96, four World Series wins, six participations. Uh, that's a that's a team that feels like they can put their foot on any opponent's throat, yeah. and the Yankees have not felt that way. Even 2009, there was a tortured reason history, and I'm glad they came out on the other side, but it has not been the same since opening day 2004. Maybe that's why Stroman wears that shirt. Bring those – maybe that's what the dog vibe is. Okay. Red Sox were idiots. Yankees are dogs. Either way, I love seeing him in that shirt on game day in the dugout, which I don't know. Previous generations of Yankee leadership management, I don't know, would say, hey, uh, Marcus, you know, it's a good look for uh, today's game where you're not pitching, but you're going to be visibly in front of the camera and celebrating. You should wear an old T-shirt. But these Yankees are different. They're letting him wear an old ass T-shirt. And for me, uh, that is the best vibes moment of the trip. Uh, And Honestly, close second, the Volpe run, the mad dash that you brought yeah. up and, and that I kind of, I mean, that was just like, oh, like, so we're on a four game winning streak to open the season where we got another tough road series. And not only are we going to win this game, but we're going to make the NL champions look silly in the process, throw the ball over the field. Like, oh, I guess that's, I guess that's where we are right now. So that's my second placer. But number one vibe is, is Stroman's t-shirt. Yeah. Speaking of dumb, that T-shirt, and we thought it was dumb for wearing it to spring training. Um, I did something dumb. Well, I watched Fever Pitch recently. Why the fuck did I do that? I've never what seen. I before. think about watching the 04 Red Sox documentary because I love I baseball, and I, I like remember. I'm like, oh, that's. I mean, look, I, I bet they have great footage. And then before I put it on, I'm like, you absolute fucking idiot. No. <laughs> I honestly didn't know that it was going to reference that. I just thought it was a movie about, a re- and I'd never seen it. And I like the whole build- time they're on the field. The yeah. other than Kurt Schilling's existence, Jimmy Fallon and Drew Barrymore being on the field is yeah. the only thing that invalidates the 2004 Red Sox title. It's the best part of the championship for me. Obviously, Kurt Schilling, uh, far and away the grossest thing about that championship. But Fallon and Barrymore hanging out, it's like the one thing you're still able to hold on Red Sox fans. Like, yeah, your historic moment though included. Uh, the cast have never been kissed. So how about that? <laughs> and I love Drew Barrymore. I love Jimmy Fallon. Why did I do that? I don't know. Um, but the Yankees are fine. So I didn't jinx anything. Stroman didn't jinx anything. Um, anyway, my best vibes moment, not watching Fever Pitch. It was um, Luis Heal's start and the resulting uh, move from Aaron Boone. Uh, Luis Heal, what are you going this one? I have it up. Four, four and two thirds. One earned. One run, uh, I'm sorry, one earned run, one hit, three walks. Um, he labored a little bit, 84 pitches. At that point, Aaron Boone felt the need to take him out, which unfortunately did not leave him in line for the win. You got to pitch five innings to get that win if you're starting a game. Um, and uh, usually, you wrote about it, a move like that would have just backfired. Seemed like you could have just left heel in. But guess what? The Yankees had the bullpen to make it happen. Um, or at least they had the confidence that the bullpen would be able to uh, finish the job. Um, they had a nice little conversation on the mounds, all smiles from everybody. There was no, um, there was no discontent. There was no ha- passively handing the ball off and, and leaving. There was no shrugging of the shoulder, shaking of the head, rolling of the eyes. We've seen that so many times when Aaron Boone has made a pitching change at what felt like an inopportune time or some, or in a spot where a pitcher was like, nope, I want to stay in. I want to stay in. Um, and the fans felt the same, but this, I felt I wasn't against it. I also wish he would have just finished the inning either way. Heel was more than happy to exit with the manner in which he pitched great outing hitting triple digits. He's showing up on fucking pitching Ninja all over the place. Um, we saw his historic start with this team in 2021 and it was absolutely electrifying. Uh, right. It was 2021, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, because, um, yeah, missed missed most of 2022 and then all of last year with Tommy John. Um, he is back. The Yankees, I don't know if they refused to include him in trade talks um, or if his value was completely deadened because of Tommy John. Um, but either way, um, Yankees have seemingly made all the right moves with um, evaluating their pitching staff with who they were going to use, who they were going to part with. Luis Heal sneaking into this rotation because of the injury to Garrett Cole delivers first outing has great vibes and is appreciative of the fact that he's back on the mound. He put up a very, very good outing against the NL champs. Um, and it makes you feel good. That's all just the definition of good vibes. 
those were great. Those were great vibes. And and the, the him and Boone had like a passionate conversation yeah. on the mound where they looked like they were laughing before he took him out. And that was, I think, I have a friend who doesn't complain very often about the Yankees. I think that's the first time he complained all year. Like, leave him in, cowards. I was like, there you go. Now you're on the train. Now you're complaining. Uh, but uh, no, it, it worked because usually that doesn't work. Usually it's too cute by half. And you're like, well, I get it. But like, they're going to be, look, how, how much more careful are you really being letting him throw 84 pitches versus letting him throw 88? Just closing the inning. He looks stronger than he used to. But ultimately, it didn't matter at all. That should have been a teaching lesson to everybody as well that, hey, we might be starting this season on a different foot in the, in the worst vibes moment of, of the series. And honestly, I mean, there's really nothing to compete with here. It's just Nestor Cortez's first inning. But yeah. all, all things considered, for the worst vibes moment of the series, it wasn't even that bad because he recovered again to be pretty good again for the duration of the game. He uh, has got first inning problems. Last year, he had second and third time through the order problems. And I tell you, which is a worse problem to have, the thing he had last year, because it meant he didn't have stamina, and it meant he had a problem in his shoulder, and it recurred twice. So starting off on the wrong foot, he's got to learn how to manage himself again. But the fact that he's able to build up and eventually use his pitchability skills to get through these lineups the second and maybe third eventually time is pretty encouraging. That said, we wrote about this this week, the myths, you know, the early season overreactions that feel valid, like watching heel, watching Volpe, and then the one early season overreaction not to fool yourself with. Uh, don't get it twisted. Like the Yankees are six and one. They look great. Don't be like, hey, everything's perfect. No need to change. The rotation is proving the haters wrong. Bad day to be a Yankees rotation hater. Let's just keep it rolling. Well, they could definitely use another starting pitcher. And they could, whoever's available at the deadline, they should be interested in. It's a shame that they weren't able to get extra depth for money alone. But the money ended up being crazy. And I don't know if somebody like Michael Lorenzen really moves the needle. Still waiting to see him in action. Uh, but yeah, Nestor, and then we'll talk about Radon, and we'll talk about what he'll able to give you, uh, and maybe even Clark Schmidt hits that innings cap eventually, which is informal, but if it does exist, he's going to hit it. So they do need another starter, and not just Garrett Cole, who obviously you hope comes back June 1st. He said he's pain-free when he was in the dugout the other day, uh, doing the call with Cone and, and Michael Kay, which was great. Great use of airtime during the only loss of the Yankees season so far. <laughs> Uh, so he helps if you can get him back, obviously that changes the pitching trajectory, but, uh, yeah, I think you still probably want to go out and get another starter. Uh, the only other bad vibes I can think of is that you probably at some point looked up and realized, oh, the Red Sox schedule was drawn up by fucking Bill Belichick and Peter Griffin this week. Cause holy fuck, they <laughs> face Seattle to start the season on the road. And you're like, oh, an actual challenge for the Red Sox this year. That's interesting. And then you realize after they split that series and don't look very good, that, oh, they get to go to Oakland and then go to Anaheim. That's their West Coast road trip that those fans are complaining about. And then they get to get Anaheim again at home. What is this? Uh, so they're going to start the season hot. I don't know what kind of team they are. I know they're better than the fans who were boycotting the team seem to think they were. But, yeah, they're going to start the season uh, close to the top of the division, probably finish April close to the top of the division. And we'll have to contend with that, too, because – MLB schedule makers gave them a last place schedule. Try to get back in it, prod them in the butt, and they're gonna they're gonna challenge the Yankees and Orioles for supremacy for quite a while, it would seem. But other than watching the Red Sox play Oakland and watching Nestor struggle again briefly, I didn't really have any bad vibes in this series. Yeah, I didn't either. Um, but I have I have one. Um, and it's just First of all, fuck the Red Sox. Forgot to yeah. mention that. I mean, it's can't stand un them. unbelievable. But just can't stand them. Can't fever stand anybody. Fan. I hard fever pitch fan though over here. I'm surprised yeah. you don't love these guys. I mean, yeah, that was <laughs> that almost that almost took me to the other side. Jimmy Fallon just fucking wearing his Red Sox pajamas. Well, you got to feel the pain of Red Sox fandom. It's uniquely painful because <laughs> they've never seen a baseball championship in 2004, but they have seen an NBA record-setting number of basketball championships as well as many hockey championships as well as some super bowls so unique pain for those fans <laughs> those red sox fans in 2004 man now they can die in peace after previously saying that out loud after 16 different celtics boston titles. does heartbreak different boston, only it. in boston the twitter account this week that i can't tell if they're kidding or not tweeted boston is overdue for a championship and to that i say nope underdue shut up <laughs> oh bad vibes for me though um 
and I just hate to say it because I want him to have a good year, but John Carlos said, and I, I, I can't watch him. I can't. Um, predictably against Zach Gallen in that game, 0 for 3, three strikeouts. Like, uh, I don't. Or he was 0 for two with two strikeouts against Gallon, and then he struck out against McGuff. Yeah, who who ended up trying to what? walk off yesterday's game. Yeah. So and the first game he goes 0 for three with a walk with two strikeouts, and that's against Ryan Nelson. And it's just like when are when is the time that you're gonna do anything if it's not against kind of a bit of an embattled Rosh uh Astros pitching staff i know he hit that homer but like outside of that there was no meaningful moment for him in that series um and then you come to arizona and you go 0 for 6 with a walk and five strikeouts um it's just it's the same stuff it's being overpowered on fastballs it's swinging at sliders in the other batter's box i don't know what has happened um this was an mvp player i understand that that type of uh, level of play doesn't last forever, but it's like you're surrounded by the best lineup you're ever going to be surrounded. And we've progressively said that over the years. It's like, well, John Carlos Stanton, Yankees have gotten better. Technically, mm -hmm. this should be on paper the best lineup he's ever been a part of. And it's the start of the season. Hitters are behind. Say what you will. Sure. But, you know, a lot of other guys have gotten off the fast starts this year. John Carlos Stanton is no stranger to the start of the MLB season. He's a, what, a 10-year veteran at this point? Um, so I don't know. I just um, – that was one of my tweets this series. I was just like, I, I think John Carlos Stanton is just bad, and that's just what it is. Like, there's no way around it. I think that – yeah, you're 15 right. 15-year, 15-year MLB veteran, which is absolutely insane. That is crazy. Wow. Um, yeah, we were talking about how his value might just be – you know, playing in 135 games and beating the shit out of bad left-handed pitchers, and he ends the year with 25 to 30 homers and 70-something RBIs, and it's like, yeah, sure, but I don't, like, everybody always references his 2020 playoff performance, and at this point, all the only leg he has to stand on in terms of, like, clutch baseball is the 2018 season. When he kind of carried the Yankees that year, they won, what, 100 games? That was the Red Sox year. So, like, he did all he could to make sure that that offense was in tip-top shape with Aaron Judge out and with the million of million other injuries that they dealt with that year. But Aaron Judge being out was, for a considerable amount of time, I think it was 60-something games, was, mm -hmm. was bad. Um, and he put the team on his back. He had an, a tremendous year. And then ever since then, it's just, to me, it's been nothing. Outside of, again, the 2020 playoffs, which one series against the Rays, no fans in the stands in California where he's comfortable. Like, it was all teed up for him, and he did it. Got the job done. Guess what? We lost a series. Ever since then, it's just been weeks, two weeks of hot stretches, followed by two to three weeks of dismal play, followed by 10 days of a hot stretch, followed by three weeks of terrible play, and it's could be because of injuries. It could now be because the mental aspect of the game has knocked him down many a peg because fans are, and the media are kind of relentless, but to me, he just doesn't have it. And I don't know when he's going to have it. And I, I really do think like when we, what we talked about earlier this off season, it's like his ceiling is just beating down bad pitchers that are lefties and that's it. And he, he cannot be in the four or five hole. He just can't be. Like, there's got to be better value for him. I understand that this team needs to turn the order over, but, like, they're getting no production from Jose Trevino. So, like, why not just start Austin Wells and put Stanton in the seven or eight hole, move everybody up? Like, I don't know. But watching his at-bats, it's just sad for me. It, they're so uncompetitive, and it's it's it just seems like the game has passed them by. And, yeah, I brought the vibes down considerably. <clears throat> Well, we'll bring him back up. I mean, something uh, something to consider too. Trevino has obviously not looked quite the part so far this year either, and he was taken out in the end of that loss for Austin Wells. Come in in the middle of that game. What are you saving his legs for? Is he still battling the injury that had him start spring training a little bit late? I mean, that's you got Ben Rortfett doing well so far in in Tampa. I hate to pinpoint that. Well, obviously, the Yankees have catchers at the Yin Yang. If they have to call on Carlos Narvaez. They will, and I would feel pretty good about that. I would be interested in seeing what he looks like, and I 
maybe see enough of Rourke Vet. But that's some other bad vibe stuff to consider as we come home and face the D-backs. Real quick, moments that you might have missed in this series, because this does tie into one of my final points of the show. Final. I think... Uh, uh, either for me, this is Juan Soto calling the balk before the umpire did an extra yeah, innings, which good. I loved. I didn't know what he was saying. I couldn't tell if he was saying, like, I foul tip this or check this or something. And it turned out he perceived the balk and then the umpire went ahead and got it too. So good for that. Like, I don't want that to get lost in the shuffle. That was amazing. And Soto didn't have a big game yesterday or really a big series. I think he only had one hit. Uh, but that was a huge moment. Again, he is lo- he's so locked in even when he's not producing – and yesterday he missed a couple pitches. He came in angry at points. You could tell he was really ripping at the fastball. So good for him to get a moment like that as well. And then the other one, uh, because this does tie into uh, Alex Verdugo's uh, slightly strange week. Uh, I do not want to gloss over John Sterling's Alex Verdugo home run call, which was uniquely really bad. And I think he forgot to come up with one, which is okay. Uh, yeah. Talked about this before. I think, uh, there's John Sterling hate is like the most insipid, uh, like yeah. online trend because people just don't people hate the Yankees, right? They do. They don't like it. Nobody likes the Yankees. They're not supposed to. And then when you put uh, people in media outlets who don't like the Yankees at all, it becomes this classic trend of like <laughs> John Sterling is so obviously bad. And I'll just <laughs> counterpoint by saying that uh, Yankee fans grew up with him. He is the fabric of their childhood. He is the wallpaper that called the most important moments of our sporting lives. Uh, We are allowed to quibble with him when he loses a long fly ball, can't figure out if it's caught or or gone. Uh, We're allowed to be like, come on, man. But hey, guess what? Nobody really listens to the radio anymore. So now all you hear of Sterling are clipped moments behind big plays. And those are all great. His home run calls are great. If you're a Yankee fan, if you hate the Yankees, then you hate them because you don't like it when the Yankees hit home runs. Ditto the win warble. I love it. When the Yankees win, I want to hear him yelling, the Yankees win. He's an 85-year-old man. It's amazing he's still doing it. When the Yankees win, you don't want to hear it because you hate him. You want to hear him say a depressing loss for the Yankees. That would be your favorite John Sterling call. So I just felt the need to say that. Uh, we love John Sterling calls because it means the Yankees are performing well and it reminds us of when we were younger. And so John Sterling's relative skill has nothing to do with the assessment of this mid eighties year old man by the general public. Cause a lot of media members who are writing John Sterling sucks are in fact, people who do not like the Yankees and do not like to hear him feel joy. Cause it means things are going well for the Yankees. That said the Verdugo home run call, Alexander, the great trots around the bases. Uh, mm. There are better polls than Alexander, the great, feels like an accident uh i think this might be the last time we hear this sterling call and usually these sterling calls now at least the modern ones have two halves it's like uh the even juan soto last week it's a soto photo he's wonderful it's marvelous a great call but there there's two halves of it alexander the great is a random figure from history uh trots around the bases i mean is that a reference to something or is it just a word that you trotsky? used to mean i thought about trotsky <laughs> i did and that's how you know that we're sterling pilled because i did think like trotsky uh but it kind of just feels like it's alexander the great's just a guy and trot is just what he was doing um so i'm gonna need yeah i might need urban dictionary on on that one but yeah i, I think that might be the last time we hear that call because i think verdu going going gone is so easy or even alex goes to back 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 like there are so many options and that's not that probably shouldn't be one of them yeah that's not my domain but i know what you're saying yeah. um what did we miss um you might have missed this dating back to the astro series too um fucking errors stop making Errors, 12 errors. Uh, no, I'm not sorry, not 12. Um, eight errors this season. Can we not? Can we not? We had th- one in every game this series against the D backs. Anthony Volpe made a throwing error. Oswaldo Cabrera made a throwing error. And uh, Anthony Rizzo made a fielding error. Um, Anthony Volpe's throwing error yesterday when he was rushed trying to get the runner in extras nearly cost the team. Um, I understand you're not going to play perfect baseball, but every game cannot have a blemish where it's putting the team in some sort of danger. Um, And uh, yeah, I hate errors. Errors are infuriating. Errors mean, or would, 
have some sort of indication that you lack fundamentals. And when this team is playing baseball that has no semblance of fundamentals or basics, it is terrible. And that's what last year was. And I'm not saying that we're in danger of doing any of that, but um, we're in danger of repeating anything from 2023, but clean it up. Stop. We're not yeah, averaging lean, an error a game. I'm not watching that this year. Lean more into the Volpe blazing around the bases thing yes. rather than the uh, fundamentals being shirked in favor of bad errors and Stanton swinging in the other batter's box. A uh, couple quick hits before we <laughs> sign off. Uh, does Aaron Boone hate Alex Verdugo? It's actually kind of unclear. Um, I think I'm kidding, but end of week, we got Boone uh, laughing at Verdugo yesterday for styling on his home run in extra innings, which means a Boone's feeling comfortable. Love that. Uh, you know, joking around with players on his team. He's been a player manager for his whole life, but taking shots in the media is it's funny. It's good. It's funny and good. As long as everybody agrees, it's funny and good. He said, I wish he would have taken some time to admire it. And uh, I mean, if you watch the game, he certainly did, but important to remember uh, in the context of that quote, that, Aaron Boone has reportedly told Verdugo he can only wear one chain on the field in every game. Now, I'm in favor of that because I feel like it's probably going to keep you aerodynamic. Weighing you down. Chains, multiple chains sounds tough. Um, I'd be in favor of experimenting and saying, you want you play with one chain today and then four chains tomorrow and see how you feel. And if he says, I play better with four chains, then just sort of deferring and being like, okay, fine, do your thing. Obviously, this does not need legislating. But Boone apparently told him we're going to go down to one, and Verdugo gave some quotes where he was kind of like, eh, it's sort of a bummer. So, uh, yeah, I don't really know why we're trying to bum him out already. It's not like he was dreadful last year because of the chains. He was, in fact, pretty good last year with all the chains. So uh, I'm in favor of keeping players happy and not needlessly disciplining them. So it's worth noting. Uh, and also, we know that Aaron Judge agitated for going to get Verdugo. Uh, so he's been asking about him for years. Obviously, Brian Cashman wouldn't get him if he didn't trust him. But Aaron Boone didn't exactly push for the acquisition. So you wonder. I don't know. And Boone and Cora are friends. Verdugo and Cora beefed. Boone's going to try not to play into any of that this year, but he knows what happened. He's not going to shy. You know, he can't. you can't delete it from yeah. your brain. You know that he beefed with your friend in the other city where he played. So I wonder if that's just something to monitor for the rest of the year. I'm I'm half kidding, but I'm actually like at wondering. least half, half serious and kind of wondering like how is Boone perceiving this guy, especially yeah. since Verdugo is now the driving force behind yeah. the dogs, behind like the team mantra. So like. I don't know. I hope that he and the manager got on the same page. Yeah, I agree. Um, look, this is the Yankees, dude. They don't do fun stuff. Sorry. Um, yeah. They just don't. You got to shave your face. You got to act right in front of the media, which, I mean, not the toughest of asks, but you like a fucking, you like a juicy quote every once in a while, and the Yankees typically don't give that. Um, the presentation is big with the Yankees, you know. I, you guys have been watching them long enough. You know how it goes. Um, do I support it? No, I don't. Um, I want Alex Verdugo to be comfortable. Um, I want everybody to feel like they can be themselves. But if you're coming here and right off the bat, you like to grow facial hair, you're not able to be yourself. So it's a little bit difficult. If you have long hair or dreads or whatever, you're not allowed to have that. So there, there's an element that you must strip down as an individual that could affect who you are, who you want to be viewed as and what your representation is. That said, um, I, I think we can all agree here and there uh, for how long we've been watching baseball and have been watching Alex Verdugo. The man can be a bit much. Um, I don't think Certainly it's said that last year. Like we're yeah. not going to pretend we didn't say that. Last I don't year. think it's a bad thing. I think it's a bad thing if it gets out of hand or if it's misplaced or um, if it doesn't, uh, if it doesn't like ride the proper wave with whatever the vibes are. Um, like I don't need Alex Verdugo just in theory. I don't think he would do this, but I don't need him jawing at the opponent when we're losing 10, nothing mm -hmm. that would not represent the kind of dog that we're looking for. But if we're talking about the dogs and how they have kind of pushed and shoved these first seven games of the year, um, I think the agitation and the fit and the edge is kind of perfect. And I wouldn't fuck with it, but I'm not the Yankees, so I can't make the decision. Um, the lone benefit 
you know, we were not happy when they acquired Alex Verdugo. I didn't want a former Red Sox on the team. I didn't want somebody of his personality based on what we had heard, you know, in other stops across the league. Um, didn't want somebody who kicked the Yankees ass repeatedly and kind of, you know, enjoyed talking smack on them. Just didn't want that on the team. But guess what? He is a guy who will adapt to his environment. I think he's proven that right off the bat. He's happy to be here. You know, you saw him and Judge celebrating after that home run. Judge is happy to have him. Judge is the captain, dude. If Judge is happy to have him and Judge wants him and this is working out, then, like, leave it alone. Leave it alone. And you know Boone is not definitely not a guy who is um, – I wouldn't say uh, – accept. he's not not accepting of this, but, like, Boone is a measured dude. He yeah. probably doesn't want – you know, things getting out of hand in the dugout. Again, a player's guy, he let he maybe lets the players get a little bit um, uh, away with more than what they should. Um, and maybe Verdugo's the line for him. Maybe he's like, all right, this is getting out of hand. We got crazy appearance. We got, you know, wild home run celebration that, honestly, when was the last time you saw a Yankee do that? Again, not opposed to that. I'm, I'm totally fine with Alex Verdugo pipping a home run, but this is a culture ish shock for the Yankees. They don't have these kinds of players. They don't, they, they, these, this is not of their identity, I guess. And that needs to change. I'll be the first one to say that. So I get why Aaron Boone might be wanting, wanting to dial it back. I don't think he hates Verdugo. I think that, no. I, I think that in instances he can rub him the wrong way. And maybe this is where he has to play manager. Keith McPherson was on here a couple of weeks ago and he said that Boone this year, Full test, going to have to manage personalities. You import Marcus Stroman, you import Alex Verdugo. Not bad guys by any means, but mm. louder personalities, very different from um, the the kind of um, uh, representation you've had with this core of players since, what, 2018, 2019? So, yeah, things are about to get upended in a certain way. I wouldn't say it's bad, but it will require monitoring and managing for sure. So maybe this is the first part of Boone kind of setting the tone and being like, look, we had our fucking fun. Now let's chill out because we have business to take care of and it's not going to be all fun and games. I don't know. Um, you try managing a dugout full of, you know, 26 players. Yeah. I don't want to, but you know who does everyone on Twitter. They all, do. Uh, <laughs> they would be good at that. Uh, I mean, quick check in. We already checked in on Carlos right on, but he is, yeah. uh, if healthy is the, one of the key lynch, you know, top three most important pivot point on this roster. If he's healthy and talented or healthy and dominating, then the Yankees are in a really good spot. If he is unhealthy or if for some reason, uh, you know, whether it's back injury residuals or whatnot, he just can't get to where he needs to be, then they're in trouble and then they need to maybe overpay at the deadline. So far, I'd give it a so good. It's early in the season. He is building up. If you're worried about velocity, well, he's hitting 98. If you were worried about being able to compete against good teams, Houston and Arizona, their short starts, yes, he's drenched in Houston in the terrible New Jerseys that look like he bathed in ink before the game. But yes, he looks pretty good in both difficult circumstances. Two starts, he gets through nine and two-thirds innings, strikes out seven, but that doesn't really worry me. The whip is 176. He has walked five. He has allowed 12 hits. Uh, he's only allowed three earned runs. He didn't really skate in and around that much trouble. The Diamondback start was better than the Houston start. He had traffic on the bases that he got out of in Houston. Yeah. But again, first two starts of the year. Here's what I want to see from Carlos Rodon. Results, it'd be great. And we saw them. Uh, maintaining that velocity, we saw that. Uh, secondary stuff looking good, we saw that. Bad command in the first game. He acknowledged it, said he didn't even care. Uh, just wanted to get the team win, and he did. Better command in the second game. That's also what I want to see from him. Good yeah. post games where you're in the locker room and you're trying to bait him with a question. I mean, hey, were you frustrated by your bad command in this game? And instead of saying something like, yeah, I'm going to kick my command's ass. I hate myself. He <laughs> says, I love winning and I felt great. And that's what you want to hear. You want him to feel good uh, physically and mentally. I have been more than satisfied with what I've seen from him so far. And guess what, everybody? He's going to have a bad start at some point. Yep, so did Garrett for. Cole. So did Garrett Cole. So will Stroman. Nestor's had a couple. It's going to happen. And when it happens, you better make sure this guy's not falling. He needed two games like this to prove to the fans that he does still have it. And now we know he does. So now have yourself a normal season. Try to stay healthy. And when the bad times come, bounce back from them. As long as the stuff is maintained, I'm fine with it. That's where I'm at on Rodon. I'm not sure if you feel differently. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, this was probably what I expected. Um, I didn't expect him to get rocked at the start of the year because I thought that would be – that's low-hanging fruit. They're like, oh, he had a bad year last year, so just wait for this year. Yeah, first start's um, going to be bad, bad, bad. Like, yeah, okay. no, he had a full off season to work. He's a professional baseball player. He knows what – he knows what the workouts and the, and the, and the commitment takes. So I think he prepared himself. I think there is also an element where it's like, he still has to get back to where he was and uh, rediscover his ACE form. Um, and that was never happening at the start of the season. So this to me is the, the second best case scenario, pitching solidly, um, showing some shortcomings and flaws and struggles, but overcoming them time and time again. Um, and having the team first attitude. Um, I didn't like, like I said, I did not like the overthrowing yesterday. I think he was trying to do too much. Um, and that puts you in danger of making a bad pitch um, or hurting yourself. Um, so that was not, um, th that did not encourage me. But I think for the most part, what he's been able to do is night and day compared to what we saw last year. Because last year was a lot of kind of, not giving up, but it was like when, when one moment went bad, it was just an avalanche. It was a complete domino effect of of, of awfulness. Um, and we're not seeing that this year. We're seeing him get the small victories by, you know, getting out of that jam with runners on first and second and, you know, nobody out. Um, uh, bouncing back after giving up a home run on a bad one-two pitch. Like, what more can you ask for? I understand he costs a lot of money. You could bitch about that until the cows come home. But this is what we have. This is the road it's going to take. If it's a year and a half late, then so be it. It's a six-year contract. If the next four, three, four years are good, it's a win. So I'm happy with what I've seen. I like his attitude. I like to. I like his resilience a lot. Rooting for him really hard. I think a lot of Yankee fans are. I think the negative discourse has kind of um, overshadowed the fact that everybody acknowledges how important he is and they want him to be who he was. Everybody was excited when we signed him. Don't lie to yourself. You were. Because you were sitting there and you were saying, oh, man, the Yankees don't spend money anymore. They don't get those badass players. Oh, wait, now they're spending money and they're kind of getting a badass player who had two really good years. So this is cool. And then he sucked. And you're like, oh, of course I knew this deal would suck. Yeah. No, you didn't. You were excited. We were all excited. We didn't want that to be the – we didn't want him to have the worst year we could have possibly imagined. But now, year two, new vibes, new roster, new expectations. He's kind of grinding, and I think he's on his way to being back. Do I think he'll be back to – Cy Young FIP leader in the league form? No, maybe next year, sure. But right now, I think we're looking at a very good number three pitcher. I think we are too. And that's why I think we need to think about going out and getting somebody who has number two upside. But yes. that's the problem for a couple of months from now. Shane Bieber, you know my cell number. Garrett Crochet, if you get tired of pitching in Chicago, give me a call. You're controllable mm -hmm. through 2026. I don't hate it. Uh, that's kind of a volatile ad. But hey, Tristan McKenzie. You know where I'm at. You know my X handle. X. Uh, I'm on X. Uh, Toronto Blue Jays coming into town. The Yankees are playing a home game. I didn't think that was possible. Uh, we'll see you. I will see you again on Monday. Uh, Thomas is off. We'll both be back on Thursday. I'll do a little quick something on Monday, probably. <laughs> Maybe not, depending on how the series goes. But uh, we gave the Astros to the Blue Jays on a silver fucking platter last week. And we said, hey, you, you ever want to kick the Astros while they're down? Why don't you come into Houston, show them what's what. Toronto Blue Jays go ahead. Hey, thanks, boss. Uh, go ahead and get no hit by the Astros five starter. Down to their final out in the second game, Davis Schneider homers, and they go ahead and win that against Josh Hader. Good job. And then, uh, oh, and you just get one hit for good measure in the series finale. Uh, and bench Davis Schneider. And they asked John Schneider about it, the manager, and he was like, first of all, shut up, fat boy. Second of all, I don't know, I'm confident in my matchups or whatever. Shouldn't be confident in anything. You lost a playoff series last year, you big idiot. So here they come. <laughs> we get Marcus Stroman against the Jays on Friday. Uh, Clark Schmidt and Luis Heel will round out the series. I always hate seeing the Jays. No fan base talks more shit. Again, I said this before, and I really mean it. I honestly hate Blue Jays fans more than I hate Red Sox fans, which is crazy. That said, when the two teams play each other, I want to see Toronto win 30 to 1. Uh, but the fan bases. Boston somehow less insufferable despite sending off tweets about how Boston is owed a championship after five really long and sad years. Meanwhile, we have Julius Randle getting shoulder surgery over here in New York. Uh, Red Sox fans are the I never thought anybody would top Red Sox fans. But honestly, for me right now, it's Blue Jays fans one, 
Red Sox fans two, Duke students three, Duke University students. Not fans, but if you actually okay. chose to enroll in Duke University, <laughs> there's something wrong with your brain. Uh, and those are the top three worst fan bases at the moment. And here comes Toronto uh, for a liquored up Yankee Stadium crowd, one o'clock tomorrow. Uh, look, the good vibes aren't going to last forever. You're not going to win every series. I would really, really like to win this series. Yeah. Um, yeah. Write the eulogy now. I, this is, I've never been more confident um, in a series against a division rival this early in the year, at least in, in the modern era, mm -hmm. um, in the present day. Um, I, I, be, I would bet you know, DraftKings, Yanks go yard, put your first uh, $150 in bonus bets on Marcus Stroman. That, that game's a win for the Yankees on Friday, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Um, 10 hits and two runs for the Blue Jays over the last three games. And what's notable about this? You tell me. Um, actually, I will tell you. Uh, hmm. The Yankees did them a favor, did them a favor, and put the Astros in the worst possible fucking position they could possibly be in to the start of the season. And I know I said possibly twice, but that's mm -hmm. I'm trying to stress it as mm -hmm. much as I can. The Yankees swept them in four games. They had late comebacks in all of them. They destroyed the bullpen. They overworked the starting rotation. This series was lined up for the Blue Jays. I'm not saying go in and sweep. I'm not even saying go in and win the series. It was lined up for you to go in there and be competitive. And you scored two runs and registered 10 hits across three games. And that's nine hits in the middle game. Nine hits in the middle no game. hitter and a one hitter sandwich. So that's even generous. I'm sorry. It was nine hits. Yeah. They had eight hits in that middle game. Cool. Good job, guys. Ronel Blanco, his eighth career start, no hits you. Then you win the set. Like, Christian Javier is good. I understand how he was able to um, uh, take down the Jays in um, the finale. They beat. They, they don't beat Framber Valdez. They beat the bullpen. Um, but Framber looked untouchable after seemingly having some command issues against the Yankees. Um, so you had an opportunity here to at least set the tone with Blanco on the mound in the first game of the series and you get no hit and then you're completely helpless because you have two of you have the, the the two best Astros pitchers going up against you after that and you predictably lie down outside of you know Josh Hader not having the greatest start to the season he um he threw that bad pitch to Schneider and that was it um so but Chris Bassett gets absolutely shelled who's this guy um uh, Bowden Francis. Yeah. Who is that? Uh, made the team out of spring training. Yeah. Blue Jays uh, fans have been talking about him. They think he deserves a second chance. He got rocked against the Astros. I know it's not the easiest, you know, Berrios puts up a good start, but it's like, where are the Blue Jays bats? All I hear about how talented this lineup is. And then when, guess what? When you look at it, we made fun of the Blue Jays this off season. Why? Because their additions for the Good departing players were Justin Turner and Isaiah Connor Falefa, and that was to make up for the losses of Whit Merrifield and um, Brandon Belt. Like, what upgrades were were those? You're just sitting here expecting the rest of the roster to get better, and for your supplementary additions to magically produce. I, the Blue Jays have had a really good opportunity to get better and to stick it to a lot of opponents. And I think they failed miserably over the last few off seasons. Um, and again, yeah, it, it's close for me who I hate more. Yeah. I guess at the very least I can respect Blue Jays fans for being unwaveringly cocky, despite accomplishing mm -hmm. nothing in third, like literally nothing in 30 years. And you can't call an ALCS birth an accomplishment because um, then that would mean the Yankees accomplished something over the last, you know, seven years. And it's been the worst stretch of Yankees baseball imaginable, um, for, you know, again, their expect we're blessed, but for their expectations, very bad stretch of Yankees baseball over the last seven seasons. Yeah. Um, even the last 14, however you want to, however you want to splice it, go ahead. But the blue Jays literally have done nothing since 1994. Um, and I have to hear that, you know, we're, we're about to we're about to, the we're about to see the movie. The trailer came out in 2021 when they didn't make the playoffs. That was the the trailer was not making the playoffs, and then the movie was it was not winning a playoff game, and then missing the playoffs again. I don't know. It's it's just it's it, it's crazy how um, how underwhelming they are.
and how good they and how good the fan base thinks they are and they're just really not like even the opening series against the rays like they split those series they got completely shut down by aaron savali and zach Littell. Mm -hmm. who are those people i mean they're fine but like they're getting blanked by pitchers that they have no business getting blanked. And the Yankees offense hasn't been overly impressive, but like they've been putting traffic on the bases. You can't get nine hits across three games. Unacceptable. Um, I believe that's unacceptable. Yeah. Beyond unacceptable. So you get Chad green, get a win the other night. I don't know. This team just, this team eternally frustrates me for both, you know, when they beat us and it's completely annoying. And then when they're performing like, a triple a team elsewhere it's just that they they can never satisfy me until the yankees end their season which they predictably will at some point um that's the only time i've ever satisfied to watch or hear about the blue jays it'd be nice we clinched the al east in toronto a couple of years ago in vlad's house and i would enjoy doing the same this year quite frankly but it begins this weekend we'll see how it goes uh thank you for joining us uh appreciate it as always again i'll be back here two o'clock eastern on monday trying to put a show together probably i guess pending as the series turns out, then Thomas and I will be back here on Thursday afternoon, 2 o'clock, and on all podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify, your favorite podcast platforms. You can find us there. I am Adam Weinrib. You can find me on Twitter at Adam Weinrib, Thomas Carinante. Where can the people find you? I'm at Tommy's underscore takes. We are both at the official Yanks Go Yard Twitter account at Yanks Go Yard FS. Um, head on over to yanksgoyard.com. Plenty of content there for you. We're having a great time covering these games, keeping you guys informed. Thanks for reading. Thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. Blue Jays coming to the Bronx. Here it is. Opening, uh, home opener. Enjoy your weekend, everybody. I'm, I'm expecting a beat down and you know, I'm historically not that confident. Um, so here we go. Enjoy it. Have some fun. We'll talk to you again on Monday. I'll be in Vegas. So hit me up. Maybe I'll play some bets for you. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, about to have a good time. I think it's going to be a good weekend for the Yanks. I think it is too, but we will see. Thanks for joining us as always. We'll be back to recap it next week. Good stuff, everybody, and go Yankees.